Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, Should I Stay or Should I Go? The Journeys of Jewish Educators. This is the second part of a three-part webinar series on the newly published CASG Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education Study titled Career Trajectories of Jewish Educators, Key Findings for the Funding Community. This study was generously supported by the Jim Joseph Foundation and the William Davidson Foundation. I just wanna thank them for their partnership in thinking through these webinars and helping us put these together. Today, we are going to have the opportunity to have a high level presentation of the key findings and a facilitated discussion on the unique questions, concerns, and opportunities of the funding community, and to translate this research into practice and policy. We are joined today by Rachel Abraham, Senior Advisor for Education, Grants, and Programs at the Mayberg Foundation, Dr. Ariel Levitas, Managing Director at CASG, and Dr. Wendy Rossov, Founder and Principal at Rossov Consulting. It's wonderful to be able to dive into this research today with a funder who has been working in this space um, in the space of Jewish education for many years, and researchers who were, in, were part of the research team and analyzed the data for this career trajectory study. And with that, I would like to invite Rachel to get us started today and help frame the conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Tamar. And um, thanks to JFN for inviting me to join today. Um, of course, I also want to thank the Jim Joseph Foundation and the Davidson Foundation and my colleague, Stacey Scherner, and Manny Menchel for inviting me to be the kind of one consumer representative of the reports uh, today, and, uh, and even more for supporting CASG in producing this robust work. There is really so much information that was uh, garnered through these different reports and, um, and presented to us as a field so helpfully. And I think today, you know, we'll, we'll get to both hear some of that and hopefully discuss what we as funders uh, might do with the data that's been presented. So just to frame a little bit of the discussion for today, I think, um, I guess two things I'd add. One is that um, as a field, I think we know those of us interested in education for, for many years know that teachers are really the lever for educational success for students. And so it's really crucial for those of us that care about various strands of education within the Jewish community to be discussing how we both recruit and retain Jewish educators and help them become the best that they can be. This is a discussion that's going on you know, nationally uh, for all different kinds of educators and we need to be having those discussions as well. And then I think separately, um, I'd love for us to kind of put on the lens today that, um, again, kind of as a consumer of all the data and reports that CASG has given us and think about how we um, as professionals, as funders deal with data when it's presented to us, how can we use the reports now to help us set agendas and make policy decisions? How might we come together um, as a Jewish education ecosystem to think about what this data tells us and what our next steps might uh, might be. I just, you know, I, I was just reading Jim Joseph's uh, latest newsletter about their new work in R and D, and and they mentioned how they are looking to discover the unknown by identifying unmet needs, aspirational users, and future projects. And it made me think about how, um, even not specifically in R&D work, but just in research and learning, we need to really think about what does the data tell us and what can, we, what can that help us aspire to? So really, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our researchers, the, both from Kazvi and from Rasov, Ariel and Wendy, uh, who are going to really present us with uh, a certain set of data that they'll explain more about today. Uh, of course, we welcome questions in the chat while they're speaking. Tamara and I will monitor uh, the chat and interrupt the presentation if there are clarifying questions and other questions will be held for the end when I hope we'll have a rich discussion after we've gotten a summary of the, of the data and the information. So Ariel and Wendy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Thank you so much for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Arielle Levitas. I'm the Managing Director of CASG, the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education. And our mission is to improve the quality of knowledge that can guide Jewish education practice and policy. And I am thrilled to be joined uh, by Dr. Wendy Rosoff from Rosoff Consulting. We'll be co-presenting some key findings uh, from the recent career trajectory study as relates specifically to the retention of Jewish educators. Um, as mentioned, the study was funded by generous grants from the William Davidson Foundation and the Jim Joseph Foundation. And we are delighted to have Rachel Abraham serve as host of the program today. So if you could go to the next slide. I just do want to take a minute, and I know that many of you maybe have 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 heard the show before, but I did want to take a minute to give you a balcony view of the larger study um, and acknowledging that we won't even come close to covering all of its components. Um, so you can find the reports and briefs um, and more are forthcoming on our website and I'll drop a link in the chat in a moment, but um, but or like in short, the career trajectory study is a larger scale multi-strand program of research. Uh, it was designed through a signature process at CASG, whereby we bring together researchers, practitioners, funders, and other stakeholders in Jewish education um, to generate a set of pressing questions um, for which more knowledge could reasonably lead to uh, the capacity to make better decisions, to fuel improvements in Jewish education. Um, and an important principle in our work at CASG is that research questions are informed by the concerns of people in the field on the ground and what they say they need to know. Um, and those are relationships that we maintain with practitioner leaders throughout the research cycle. And so informed by multiple stakeholders in Jewish education, CASG developed this set of researchable questions that pertain to the um, recruitment, retention, uh, and development of Jewish educators. And the, the puzzle pieces here sort of summarize those key questions that animated um, the investigation in each of the strands. Um, so, uh, and I should also say that in addition to input from practitioner leaders, um, funders, et cetera, we did assemble a technical advisory committee made up of scholars in general education and Jewish education to guide the project. Um, so we're gonna be sort of in the quadrant on the upper right on the journey today. We'll be mostly talking or really exclusively talking about educators already in the field um, for more than five years to 30 years. Next slide. Okay, so I just want to also just touch on very briefly the definition of who a judge, an educator is, a Jewish educator is for the purposes of this study, because it's a little broader than some other um, previous work in this arena. So for, um, for our definition, right, Jewish educators include people who are post-college age, they work for pay, that could be full-time or part-time, um, they work directly with people who identify as Jewish in some way, so they're involved in direct instruction. Um, they can work in a range of settings um, that are built to help people find meaning in Jewish texts, Jewish experiences, and Jewish community. Um, and so we know that Jewish education happens in lots of places. They could be inside, out, outdoors. Um, uh, in person and increasingly online. So we sort of looked at the field as having uh, five sectors. And I'll just kind of give you a very brief rundown of the sectors before we dig into um, the on the journey data. So formal Jewish education includes um, day schools, uh, early childhood and supplemental or part time Jewish schooling. Um, what we call informal or experiential includes youth groups, camps, um, uh, JCCs, et cetera. Um, sector three uh, is engagement, so um, social justice and innovation. So that might include institutions like One Table or Moisha House, uh, Repair the World. Sector four, communal organizations, the, for example, federations, um, JCRCs, et cetera. And then sector five are non organizational networks. Um, or those platforms that are fully online, like Shalom Learning. Okay, so to get a little bit more in depth into the snapshot that we're going to give today of OTJ, I'm going to pass things over to Wendy now, please. Thank you, Ariel. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. The research design for the on the journey strand of the overall project to which Ariel uh, referenced a minute ago called for us to explore the relationships between individual educator characteristics such as age, the sector in which they're working, gender identity, pre-service training, pre-career Jewish education or experiences that these individuals had growing up, uh, et cetera. Um, the conditions and the interventions in the places in which they work, including opportunities for professional development, compensation and benefits, recognition, opportunities for advancement, professional networks, and the like, and a set of outcomes related to retention, both in their organizations and their places of work and in the field more broadly, their job satisfaction, and a sense of professional self-efficacy. Next slide. We know from research in general education that educators with, uh, with favorable workplace conditions, uh, robust professional networks, and significant opportunities for professional development in general tend to have a stronger uh, overall job satisfaction, career and organizational commitment, and again, a sense of professional self-efficacy. And we also know from general education research that these are all associated, these outcomes of job satisfaction, commitment to the field and to their organizations and professional self-efficacy are all associated with positive learner outcomes. And, and that really, of course, uh, is the end game, which is we all uh, want the, those individuals who are coming into contact with our Jewish educators to, to experience those positive learner outcomes. So, um, in, empirically for us in this study, uh, we, we did learn certainly that those with more favorable workplace conditions, which we'll discuss as we go through this deck, uh, stronger professional networks and, and importantly opportunities for professional development about which Ariel will speak later, in fact, uh, did show stronger overall job satisfaction, career and organizational commitment and a sense of professional self-efficacy. Ariel? Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, next slide when you're ready. Okay, so what we have here is a snapshot of some of the demo demographic characteristics of our on the journey sample, right? Again, people working in the field of Jewish education between six and 30 years. Um, so we can see on the left, um, the most frequently reported Jewish experiences growing up. We have overnight camp, youth group, um, supplemental or part-time Jewish education and day camp. Um, sort of moving towards the right, we'll see that um, the vast majority of Jewish educators, um, they identify as female. That was actually 83% of our sample. Um, there are some differences um, uh, like at a sector or venue level, for example, early childhood is the most female of all of the venues we looked at. And the innovation sector is the sort of the least female of them all, although still mostly female. Um, they are predominantly Jewish themselves. 90% of the educators in our sample identify as Jewish. Um, and for those who are married or partnered, 83% um, um, report that they are partnered with another person who identifies as Jewish also. Uh, and then in terms of professional credentials, more than half of Jewish educators in the sample have an MA or higher. Um, for the most part, those are not focused on Jewish education or Jewish communal service. Um, and about a quarter have some kind of certificate in Jewish education or communal work. Uh, next slide. Ariel, one clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Of Bob Luchtman just asked the Jewish experiences people could could report more than multiple one. there are multiple and remember these are sort of right these are the frequencies there's no sort of causal mechanism that we're reporting here right so. Um, uh, so right, these are the people who go into Jewish education and have been in the field for at least five years, what did they do what experiences do they have have so in terms of the top experiences Jewish day school is not is not one of the most frequently reported experiences. But again, there's not a causal 
uh, mechanism going on here. So um, it could just be in terms of the sheer number of American Jewish youth, right, who are exposed to certain, um, it was absolutely an option for response, but it wasn't one of the top um, uh, selected, of the top four selected. So it does, right, it's just part, part of it's kind of driven by what are the kinds of experiences that American Jewish children have the most frequent exposure to also. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, uh, so if we'll go back then to the, go ahead, sorry, to the next slide. Okay, so thank you. So this slide gives some insight, right, into how Jewish educators understand how they got into the work, right? So um, I know that some of you participated in our last um, webinar with the Jewish Funders Network, and we were really looking in part at how a uh, distinguishing feature of people who launch a career in Jewish education is their sense of mission. Um, so this slide is looking again at um, people who are going into the field of um, Jewish education, uh, more than been in the field, excuse me, more than five years and reflecting on how they got into this career in the first place. Um, and I think it's really interesting to note that even as we know that mission and commitment are really important, we do see like that the number one most frequently cited phenomenon that educators credit with their entry into the field is, I had a job opportunity and I decided to take it. So that doesn't you know, necessarily represent the most planful of career narratives. Um, and in many cases, people in the field of Jewish education have bypassed traditional on-ramps of formal pre-service training, and they kind of find themselves on a career pathway in Jewish education nonetheless. So these are the most frequently reported inspirations. Um, uh, so again, we have uh, had a job opportunity, my family, an inspirational educator. Those are the top three responses. All right, next slide. Okay, so if the slide before um, was giving us insight into how educators understand how they got into the work, this slide I think helps us see um, what motivates them to stay. Um, and the themes that we see here overall are largely altruistic, right, or entirely so, seeking to benefit others more broadly and also specifically uh, in the Jewish community. So we see inspiring people's life's path, life paths, expressing a commitment to educating others, um, love of subject matter, right, these are the top responses. And this, again, underscores why people are doing this work. They find it fulfilling. They have a sense of commitment to Jewish education and to helping others. Um, and this often lends um, a sense of you know, sacred dignity, of calling to work that is not often afforded high status or compensated at rates that we see in other professions. OK, next slide. So this, I think, is a really interesting slide as a way to you know, quantify commitment. Um, and we see here that a large proportion of Jewish educators are in it for the long haul. Um, they see this as a career commitment. They plan on doing this work for a long time. Um, but we also have a not trivial proportion that in the gold um, highlighted there, right? who do not know where they stand and are potentially open to influence. Um, and I do wanna say that some educators in particular are exceptionally committed to their institutions, particularly early childhood educators. Almost 40% say they plan to stay in their organization until retirement. And day school educators, 34% say they plan to stay in their organization until retirement as compared to some of the other sectors. So for example, we have like 10% in, in the innovation social justice and, uh, sector who's planned to stay in their organization for that long. Um, but I, you know, when we think about how we invest in our educators, it, it's, I think, useful to note that broadly, 46% say that they want to stay in the work of Jewish education until retirement. Um, 
And I, I don't really like to talk about people this way necessarily, but if we're like concerned about our return on investment, let's say like, it seems like if you invest in Jewish educators, at least as they sort of report their own intentions, there is a high likelihood that many are planning to stay in the field. Um, and, but we really have this big question mark here in terms of those who don't seem to have their mind made up, they're not sure, will they stay or will they go? And what are some possible inflection points um, that might influence their choices? Um, and certainly there is research in general education um, that might help us understand what it takes to retain teachers um, in the field of education. Um, and though they're fairly well aligned with some of the findings from our own study here, you know, it's really about, um, you know, workplace conditions, tackling those workplace conditions, um, um, issues related to um, pay, um, retention bonuses are shown to improve retention, um, but also issues related to teacher collaboration, access to professional learning, um, and so we're going to get into some of these themes as well now. I'm going to pass it to you, Wendy. Great. Thanks, Ariel. So um, we did have um, a group of folks at, in, uh, in addition to all those who, who responded to the survey who expressed, um, you know, the longevity of commitment to their organizations or, or the career or the field more generally. We did have a subsample of respondents who indicated that uh, they were planning to uh, leave the field, they were considering leaving the field sometime in the next two years. Um, and even with the altruistic motivations for work in the field that Ariel talked about a few minutes ago, um, and the overwhelming proportions of, of Jewish educators in the study who plan to stay long term, uh, in the on the journey strand of those who did indicate that they're considering leaving the field, 50% uh, uh, indicated that uh, the, the main motivation was uh, for better you know, financial opportunities elsewhere. In other words, um, you know, better compensation. And we're gonna, we're gonna get to compensation in a minute. Uh, relatedly, you can see 29%, you know, nearly a third um, also reference benefits. So we're gonna talk about compensation and benefits as two of those workplace conditions to which Ariel uh, referred just a minute ago. Um, over a third, uh, unable to satisfactorily balance work and personal life. So again, even with those um, personal aspirations of, of making a difference, of contributing to the Jewish community, of sort of all of those things, the, 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 the feeling that, that, you know, the inability to balance, um, you know, the work-life balance, hit the work-life balance uh, is, is really, you know, um, pushing people out of the field. Uh, and then I think at, at the bottom here at around 18%, um, and again, I think Ariel will be speaking to this a bit later, uh, insufficient opportunities for career development uh, and advancement uh, in the sector. So those are important things to keep in mind as we uh, move forward. And um, if we could, it would be great to go to the next slide. So I am gonna uh, linger a little bit on the salary and benefits piece. I'm gonna let you uh, take this in for a moment. The, the top uh, chart is, um, is satisfaction with salary and, uh, and the bottom one is uh, satisfaction with benefits. Um, I will say that in terms of uh, differences uh, across the sectors, um, you know, the, these data, these percentages here are, are pretty consistent, but just um, will say that uh, the, um, the sort of highest level of uh, satisfaction um, with salary is, is in sector four, uh, which is um, the sort of you know, federation and communal uh, organization uh, space where 55% um, of survey respondents indicated that they were somewhat or very satisfied uh, with, with their salary. Um, and then in terms of benefits, uh, again, the, the percentages, you know, um, you know, stay roughly the same as they are here in the aggregate. But again, sector four really, uh, really jumps out with 75% uh, reporting that they're somewhat satisfied or very satisfied uh, with their benefits. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, this slide shows uh, 
that there are significant differences uh, among the venues and the sectors, uh, despite um, many, many years of, of trying to elevate uh, the, the, the space and place of, of early childhood education um, in sort of our Jewish educational, you know, cradle to grave uh, trajectory here. Um, the, these are median salaries for full-time employees uh, in these various uh, venues and sectors. So um, across all venues and sectors, you can see the median salary is 56,000. You can see the ECE, full-time ECE uh, educators are grossly below uh, that median uh, uh, salary for uh, in the aggregate. Uh, in the informal sector, which I think has seen uh, informal experiential Jewish education, which has seen a lot of, of focus, philanthropic investment and focus um, over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. I think we're seeing the result of that now in terms of uh, sort of an elevated uh, median salary. And then again, in the communal sector, primarily in the federation space uh, and other uh, large communal organizations, again, where we saw salary and benefits um, really, you know, topping out here um, in terms of satisfaction, you can see uh, the median salary for a full-time employee. Uh, on average, again, as with most things, uh, female respondents are paid less than their male peers. Um, and, and in all cases, respondents who indicate sort of higher salaries uh, and more robust benefits um, have positions that add administrative work to their uh, sort of frontline teaching roles. So in order to, in order to climb the, the compensation uh, ladder um, and in order to receive you know, greater benefits packages, typically educators have to take on uh, other administrative responsibilities in addition uh, to their teaching. So I think that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Um, Going into the benefits piece a little bit uh, more deeply, you can see here the, uh, the way that we've shaded this, this particular table is the top four in the darker blue are those um, benefits that, that you know, one, one would say are sort of typical and fundamental and foundational to a positive uh, workplace experience, right? So paid vacation, um, medical insurance, uh, dental insurance, and retirement plan. And then we sort of move down from there uh, to, to, to benefits that perhaps are a little bit less common, but still very important. And then, you know, as we move down to the bottom, um, I will say that, uh, you know, if, if you take a look at this chart carefully, this table carefully, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide, and I'm sure there'll be some robust conversation around this when we get to Q&A and, and, and to conversation uh, between and among, you know, participants in this webinar, um, that, you know, looking at full-time, again, in the aggregate here, um, you know, full-time edu Jewish educators, you know, in the field, in the aggregate, um, you know, for only 45% are uh, receiving any kind of, you know, retirement plan, um, and, and only 65%, you know, only two thirds, that means, you know, one third of, of our full-time educators are not receiving any kind of paid vacation. So again, it, it sort of goes down from there. Um, generally, certainly uh, early childhood education um, lags, uh, sort of has the, the, you know, greatest lag in terms of um, benefits received. And federation-based educators have the best benefits packages uh, across the board. Um, next slide. I'll just let you uh, have a look at these uh, these quotes. These are in in the words of, and you can see there's a day school educator here, an early childhood educator, and an informal educator. Um, so you can see that, that that these issues sort of cross cross sector and venue. I'll just give people a minute to to get to read these. While people are reading, one question is uh, just was put in the chat. How do these stats compare to national statistics about com comparable professional roles? And also, is this very different than other sectors for part time? Do we know any of that from general ed or? Ariel, did you want to speak to to the general education? piece? Well, I guess I mean, I would 
I would you don't know so much that, about part time for sure. Yeah. So I think, right, it's harder to make those comparisons across to part time, but we're giving you really the just like the breadcrumbs that we hope will lead you to the website to engage with the full reports and briefs. So, um, in fact, the research team from Rosa Consulting did a lot of work to try and as you know, as best as possible for how salaries, et cetera, are reported um, across, um, you know, some analog fields, mostly K through 12 education, um, both in public schools and independent schools that can give you an early childhood, they can give you some insight into sort of how things compare across um, a, where we do have national statistics, um, wh where we can look at that. Great. I think Ariel, it's back over to you. Ah, okay, great. Um, okay. So um, I, I'm sure we'll come back to talking about um, compensation and benefits later in the Q&A, but I'm going to just share some other points of inflection. Um, so a theme that comes through, particularly, um, you know, both in the qu quantitative and also in the qualitative data is the challenge of advancing in Jewish education as a professional career. If you want to stay engaged in the work of direct instruction, if you want to teach. Um, so a little under half of our sample agree that they have opportunities for advancement. And I guess about a third of our educators um, were satisfied with their opportunities for promotion. Um, generally speaking, um, in education, right, the work, the work of direct instruction in Jewish education is overall sort of fairly flat terrain. Um, and often there are no opportunities to advance unless you are going to leave direct instruction, the classroom or whatever that looks like in your sector and go into administration. And that, um, you know, that's, that's really a shame for the field as a whole. We haven't really articulated what it means to advance in one's career as a Jewish educator doing that, that frontline work of education. Um, uh, and for, I think generally as a field of Jewish communal work and concern, you know, we do love leadership and we invest a lot in leaders, but we haven't had so much to say as of yet about teacher leaders, um, and teacher leaders are talented educators with demonstrated success in teaching and learning. Um, who I think we could say um, are something of an untapped resource in Jewish education in terms of amplifying um, the good work they do, right? Excellent teachers who lead um, by building a culture of continuous improvements in instruction in their organizations is, is a way of leading. And um, there are many roles for teacher leaders um, and that have been articulated in um, general education and research. So there's a lot of work potentially to be done uh, in this arena. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we have some excerpts from interviews with educators reflecting on how they see the terrain of their own career pathway and, and what it would mean to advance. Um, so, um, you know, if I want to advance, I can become clergy or become a religious school director. You know, I can't, you know, stay in direct instruction from an informal educator. Um, at a, a quote from a day school educator on, uh, on the bottom there, you know, thinking there's got to be a better way to, to, to do career pathway for teachers um, who want to, who want to share what they know. Um, and help advance teaching and learning in their organization. Uh, and then next slide. Okay, so when we talk to Jewish educators about what they value in their work and workplace, they talk about their access to professional learning. Um, and we, you know, we do see that many Jewish educators do not have adequate access to professional development. Um, they report that they don't know what's available to them and when they do have access, it mo most often takes the form of what we call the one shot workshop, um, which isn't really seen as a sort of high quality um, intervention that's been shown to um, improve outcomes for, for learners. Um, 
So, and I'll add that even as educators report positive relationships with their supervisors, only about half say that their supervisor understands um, or knows about their professional development needs and fewer than half report that their supervisor um, is able to serve as an instructional mentor from them. Um, and I'll say, you know, CASG's data does show, this study's data shows that experiences of professional development um, and professional nurturing, it could be coaching or mentoring as well, right? They are empirically related to some important desirable educator outcomes. And, you know, Wendy spoke about this at the beginning, their selves of self-efficacy, their commitment to their organization and Jewish education as a profession. Uh, and more generally um, to their overall job satisfaction. And again, in general education, we know that high quality professional learning contributes to positive learner outcomes. Uh, next slide. And again, we just have a few illustrative quotes um, where um, some educators from a variety of sectors are sharing uh, and reflecting on the value of professional learning for their own career development and their sense of efficacy. So I'll give you just a second to digest them, but I think we want to probably move on um, now to Q&A. Um, and I absolutely, we can share the slides with you. And again, they're, they're, they're highlighting what is just much more um, that's available across all the reports and briefs and and more is forthcoming we will look forward to uh, we have a report that we hope will be released uh, just in the next couple of days. Okay, okay. Th thank you both for such interesting and uh, informative presentation again like you said kind of just scratching the surface of really what's in four different reports just covering the on the journey part of the CASG research. So there's really a tremendous, tremendous amount of information for people who are ready to, uh, you know, to dive in and, and learn more. So with that, um, Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Tamar to, to really close us out. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel and Wendy and Ariel and all of you for participating. This was a really robust conversation and I know we could continue even more today. Um, we are gonna be able to continue for part three on this Tuesday, December 14th from 12.30 to 1.45 Eastern, 9.30 to 10.45 Pacific time. We're gonna hear from Stacy Turner of the Jim Joseph Foundation, Ariel, um, who we heard from today, and Alex Pomson from Rossoff Consulting to continue. We're going to talk about supply and demand, analyzing the labor market for Jewish educators. And I hope to see you all there. But thank you again to all of our presenters and all of you that participated. And hope to see you all soon. Have a great day.